Hi, I'm Dr. Harvey Camry from Today's Family Dental. We're located at 340 Seminole Road, corner of Seminole and 9th Street, here in Norton Shores, actually just on the border with Muskegon Heights. We are a family dental practice, so we see patients of all ages and do general dentistry. And that includes fillings and root canals and crowns and bridges and partials and dentures and braces and restoring implants, just everything. Now, we uh, also do endodontics, if I didn't mention that. But our main concern here is prevention, get people in on a routine basis and try to keep their dental costs down by taking care of things early. And that even goes with infants. We'd like to see infants about six months old as soon as they start getting teeth in so we can guide the parents in what to do with the infant and check out the kids. Most insurances cover that early infant stage so we don't end up with a three-year-old child with problems like tooth decay, which isn't fun for anybody. Not the kid, not the parents, or us. Now with the children, we don't see a great deal of rampant tooth decay, but the important thing is to get the parents to understand that they need to watch out for the use of sugary foods, whether it's fruit juice, or gum, or candy, or sodas. Any of that stuff that has refined sugar can tend to be a problem. So the other part of that is not only watching the sugar intake, is making sure the kids actually get their teeth clean. And you can start when the child is very small and clean their teeth off with a washcloth. So when they're very small, you're in control and you can make it happen all the time. Then they'll get used to the routine and at some point you may have to help them brush it first, but really stay with it. And something sweet with a meal isn't such a problem as something sweet in between meals, a snack kind of thing. If somebody's thirsty, we want them to drink water. If they're having something that's a special treat that's sugary, we don't want them sipping on it for an hour and a half while it just sits there. And then also evaluation of the kids when they're young for the need for orthodontic intervention to help make sure their mouth is wide enough to fit all their teeth, because oftentimes we'll see that the mouth isn't big enough for all the teeth, so the teeth start going funny. We like to catch that early, help the arches, you know, the upper and lower jaws is what I'm referring to as arches, be wide enough to accommodate the size of their teeth. When they're very young, there's appropriate teething devices, kind of rubbery things. I haven't had much of a problem with seeing kids come in who are chewing on the wrong things, although, you know, something real hard and sticky is probably not a great idea. I would say as far as kids chewing on things, like some infants need a pacifier. So the nuke, or there's several that are orthodontically approved, and you'll find it on the packaging that says it's a proper kind of pacifier to have a child suck on. You don't want to be going to the dollar store for a pacifier. Sometimes there they can be a problem in there not made of good materials that you want a kid sucking on, sometimes some of the plastics and so forth, and they're not the right consistency to help promote the right shape of the mouth. As people get older, they have, you know, if they haven't developed better habits with their oral hygiene, they'll come into us with, with problems of tooth decay quite often when they're younger, when they're teenagers and so forth, because teenagers tend not to want to bother with that. Well, they'll start to brush when they're dating. So, you know, when they run into the hormones kick in and they realize there's an opposite sex and they decide they want a boyfriend or a girlfriend, they'll start brushing. But what I'll usually see is they're not flossing. And because younger people are naturally drawn to sweeter materials, infants and teenagers, because Things that taste sweet generally are not poisonous, and that's a genetic thing, and they're hardwired toward eating sweet things. So they'll be drinking sodas and eating candy bars, and so generally they'll brush, but they won't floss. So we'll find all these cavities in between their teeth because the toothbrush can't reach there, and they don't want to floss because it takes too long. And, you know, quite often the first time we'll see a new patient is, is with a toothache, or they've had a bad experience with a dentist in the past who wasn't as gentle as they could be, didn't make sure the topical worked before they numbed the patient up, and then when they numbed the patient up, perhaps they injected too fast, 
And on top of all that, and I've had that experience myself, the dentist didn't get me numb. So I'm sitting there with an injection that hurt, topical that didn't work, and I wasn't numb. And then the dentist would get mad at me when I wasn't numb, like it was my fault. So I don't know if anybody out there has had that experience, but that will often keep patients away from the dentist for quite some time until they end up with usually an abscess that forces them to come in and be seen. It has to do with, you know, treating the patients like you would want to be treated. I don't think anybody would want to treat themselves to uh, a bad experience in a dental office. So basically, we try to make it as easy as possible. We have nitrous oxide for our nervous patients, or we can pre-medicate with uh, certain medications so their appointment is much easier for them. And then with the nitrous oxide or the other, sometimes they eventually get away from that because they discover we're not going to hurt them. I'm not crazy about seeing the dentist myself, but if I'm going to be seen, I want to make sure I'm profoundly numb, and then I can you know, more or less relaxed during the appointment, even though some of the stuff is quite annoying, like the drill when it's all that racket and stuff. And we still haven't been able to get around that. They've gone from air turbines to electric drills, but they're still rackety. But the most important thing is, is you don't hurt the patient. And we use a topical here that works great, but it tastes terrible. But when I've asked patients, do you want a bad flavor or do you want pain? They've all opted for a bad flavor over pain which is kind of fun. So basically, it's making sure the patient knows also that the appointment is their appointment, it's not my appointment. Okay. So we try to work with whatever's going to work for them. Now, as far as the susceptibility to decay goes, I often get this question is, you know, why am I getting tooth decay? There's a genetic factors in it we know of, but also the biggest thing is Streptococcus mutans, which is the tooth decay bacteria and it gets passed from mother to infant or from father to infant, but more often it's the mother who's the primary caretaker. She has it in her mouth, and so the kids get the infection, and they're susceptible to tooth decay. Now, you can suppress that with xylitol. It's a sweetener. You'll find it in gum and candy and so forth, but it has to be 100% xylitol. That'll help repress the mother's streptococcus mutans when the kids are young, so they're less likely to pick up those microorganisms. So there's a genetic factor, but if you don't get the infection from your parents, you're not going to have tooth decay. It's amazing. They still don't have a vaccine for it, but we know that xylitol will suppress those microorganisms. The, those streptococcus mutans don't like xylitol. It pushes down their numbers. As far as routine dental visits are very important, a lot of times people see the dentist more than they do the physician. So. When our patients come in, the adult patients are screened for high blood pressure with a blood pressure cuff. Then we'll look at their mouth and take the necessary radiographs, which are digital x-rays, so the patient can see those as well. They come up big on the computer screen here. And we'll take intraoral photos with our intraoral camera and some extraoral photos so we have a whole picture for the patient instead of me trying to point out something on a little tiny film about this big. See that little cavity there? We can show them the problems here on the screen, which is wonderful as far as educating the patients. And we check out their periodontal health, which is the attachment of the bone and gum around the teeth. So we make sure there's adequate bone and gum to keep the teeth in the mouth, which there usually is. Sometimes they need some scaling and root planing, deep cleaning under the gums to get the gums healthy. And check for non-vital teeth or impacted wisdom teeth or all of the problems. And then if they're really concerned about it, we might do a real small appointment first to get them used to our procedures here at the office, but none of it is. For, and if somebody wants to start with a certain tooth first, it's driving them crazy, we'll start with that tooth. In the early ages with most people, the chief problem is tooth decay. So that's for, you know, the infants, the kids in elementary school and high school, even through their 20s, most people don't have much trouble with their gums. They'll have a little gingivitis because they're not keeping their teeth clean enough. So that's when you just have bleeding from the gums where there hasn't been any other adverse effect. But if that plaque is left on the teeth, which is what forms when you don't keep them clean, there's plaque that forms on 
the outside of the teeth and in between the teeth where the floss goes to help clean that out, that can become what we call periodontitis, which is the next step after just gingivitis. Now that's an inflammation of the gums. It has nothing to do with tooth decay. And periodontitis has been around as long as man has been around. Tooth decay is a more recent development with refined sugar. When, when humans were just foraging out in the forest eating roots and nuts and berries and all that, they didn't have a problem with tooth decay. But there's always been a problem with periodontal disease by not keeping your teeth clean. Those microorganisms tend to build up in a plaque and irritate the tissues and cause the gum to move away from the tooth. Well, when it gets down to a certain point, it reaches the bone level and the bone starts to go away because of the plaque that's in there causing the periodontal disease. And also you'll get that tooth tartar buildup or what we call calculus. So that adds up and then the plaque gets in the tartar that's the hardened form of calculus and that comes from calcium in your saliva that hits the unfavorable environment of the bacterial infection and causes the calcium to precipitate out of the saliva where otherwise it would stay suspended and hardens it up and makes this, you know, build up on the teeth. The other thing that seems to cause a lot of problems for patients is sodas that are sweetened. Now there's even some concern about un well, sugar-free soda, even the diet stuff is worried about consumption of too much because to make that beverage have fizz, they put carbon dioxide in it, which turns it into a mild acid, carbonic acid, which the teeth are made out of calcium. And if you want to get rid of calcium, you pour acid on it. So people who drink excessive amounts of soda, whether it's diet or not, can actually wash the calcium out of the teeth and make them just eventually disappear and get softened and they'll go wear down faster. Now I don't see a lot of this in my office but I've heard about it in other offices. So our chief concern has been sodas between meals. If you're drinking a pop with a meal it's not a problem because you're eating food and it'll pick it up and help hold that sugar so it doesn't get on the teeth. And the amount of sugar in sodas is just horrendous. We have a graphic here at the office but There'll be like 12 teaspoons of sugar in one can of Mountain Dew, or is it orange, you know, orange soda. With a meal, it's not a problem. It's just sipping between meals. Diabetic patients are more subject to infection. So usually our diabetic patients, if they're being good, aren't really having a problem with tooth decay, but they will have a problem with gum disease. So the periodontal disease where the gums and the bone are lost, it tends to occur more rapidly in diabetic patients who are uncontrolled. If their diabetes is uncontrolled, they can have flare-ups in the mouth and accelerate the bone loss and actual tooth loss, so they end up in dentures. As far as tooth decay goes, if they are staying away from the sugar, they shouldn't have a problem. But if they're getting into sugar, then they'll get tooth decay. So that's the main area of concern is periodontal disease. Now, as far as genders go, mothers and the kids come in to see the dentist. The men tend to not come in and see the dentist because they tend not to see the physician either. It's like, eh, I'll do that later, eh, maybe another time. So they tend to get in trouble before they come in. Uh, but, you know, there's no reason that men can't come in. But usually the, the wife picks the dentist and the husband eventually gets dragged in here because she goes after him. Come on, come on, you got to go see the dentist. So yeah, there is a gender difference. It's usually women who are more concerned about taking care of the kids first, and then they're already here, they can't very well get out of it. Now we've talked about periodontal disease, and we've talked about tooth decay, and we haven't talked about a, a subject that often comes up, and that's jaw joint problems, otherwise known as TMJ problems. And they have come up with a new device for TMJ sufferers that we place a lot of. It's called an NTITSS, and it's a small device that goes in the front of the mouth to keep people from clenching and grinding their teeth at night. I find that most people are having problems with their jaw joints because during the night they're clenching and grinding their teeth, or clenching or grinding, either both or either or. And what this does, it sets these muscles up to be overworked and they just stay contracted and the symptoms that are often uh, teeth that are sensitive to cold, you may not have all of these, you may have some of them or none of them. Headaches, uh, 
pain by the ears, uh, jaws that tend to open and get stuck open and they can't close or they have to work them around to close them, or jaws where they can't open very wide, they can uh, uh, open like this. And usually the NTI device that won't allow them to clench or grind at night eliminates the problems. It's kind of like a splint for a broken arm. And some patients wear them every night and some wear them just some nights. If I have a very difficult case, I'll refer it to a colleague, but I find that most of my patients who are having TMJ problems have to do with stress. And, you know, there's a little stress going around, especially with today's economy. Now, after the tooth decay and the gum disease and the jaw joint problems, the other area that I see a lot of need in is enough room in the jaws for people's teeth. In other words, braces or orthodontics. We see kids all the time where we want to see a little bit of spacing in their baby teeth and a proper bite relationship. But so often we'll see crowding in the mixed dentition. After they lose the baby teeth and start to get the adult teeth, we'll notice that the front teeth don't line up because the jaws aren't quite wide enough. So we want to get in there early in what we call a phase one treatment and just widen out those arches a little bit so those Baby, or the adult teeth that are coming in to replace the baby teeth have enough room to line up. Mothers like to see that and we like to see that. If we see all the baby teeth are tight together when a child is two, three, four, five, before their adult teeth start to come in, chances are they're going to need braces because there should be a little bit of spacing between those baby front teeth. We call it primate spacing. Don't ask me why they used a monkey term, but sometimes kids are monkeys. Anyway, we want to see that spacing in there. And then if we don't, we want to get in when they're six or seven or eight and just help the arches widen out a little bit wider for those adult teeth to have room to come in. And then if we don't see it then, we'll catch it later and help them widen out the arches and put on brackets and wires. And sometimes we can use something like Invisalign to correct some less involved orthodontic problems. But Invisalign and ClearCorrect, their competitors, have limitations as to how much you can move teeth. It's hard to move the entire tooth around unless you put on brackets and wires. The other thing we also find now as people get into their teen years and sometimes later is the eruption of wisdom teeth or the wisdom teeth are trying to erupt. We try to catch those and screen for them on a panoramic film, a panoramic film, and make sure their third molars are lined up to erupt, make sure they're aimed the right way so they can erupt, and make sure that there's enough room for them to erupt. If there's enough room for them to erupt, then we let them come in. That's not very many patients. Most patients, we want to make sure that there's in good enough alignment so they can erupt as far as possible and then refer them to the oral surgeon to have those teeth removed so they don't cause problems down the road. If they're misangled, in other words, if the wisdom tooth, instead of coming, you know, is trying to come straight up behind the other tooth, is trying to erupt through it, we want to recommend that they get those wisdom teeth out because this tooth that's trying to erupt can damage that tooth ahead of it. I've seen them cause problems in that tooth ahead of it, a hole in it, so the tooth can't be saved and you end up losing two teeth instead of one. Sometimes patients will have symptoms like headaches, but we try to get periodic panoramic films here with our patients so we can get them referred at the proper time. We like to wait as long as we can so the procedure is as simple as possible for the patient, less invasive surgically in other words, so they don't have to dig so deep or so much to get the teeth out. Now as far as elective dentistry goes, there's a lot can be done with cosmetic dentistry. You can do it with braces, get the teeth lined up the way they should be. You can do it with bonding with tooth color resin materials, we've done that before, or you can do the porcelain veneers to make corrections in a smile's appearance or position of the apparent position of teeth and so forth. And the orthodontics involves two to five years perhaps to get everything straightened out. Whereas with the porcelain veneers, you can put them on the teeth and you know, you could take the impression, have it back in three or four weeks and put the new appearance on the teeth. The teeth haven't moved, but they look nice. They will tend to feel a little thicker to patients. And there's new, new alternatives in crowns too. It used to be we'd place a gold crown 
And then we placed a gold with a porcelain veneer on just the outside. And now we have full coverage with gold underneath and porcelain on top of that. And then some of the newer ones like the Emax crown, there's no metal involved and they're very strong and they're very lifelike. And you don't have to do as much tooth reduction with some of those newer materials. You're not cutting away as much tooth. And then the advent of, instead of completely enclosing the tooth with a crown, you can cover part of it and the rest of it, and then do what we call an onlay. So this, the cusps are covered up and protected instead of cutting way down to the gums. So they're less invasive that way. So there's a lot of changes have occurred in dentistry. And as far as the cosmetic stuff goes, uh, there's also simply <clears throat> bleaching as far as lightening the teeth up goes. People want whiter teeth. You can do that at home with Crest White Strips, so we can do it here at the office with a set of trays or even here at the office chair side. If somebody doesn't want to bother with the trays, we can use a far stronger formulation of peroxide gel on the teeth and lighten them up quicker. Now, sometimes people will come in as a new patient and they're missing teeth. And there's several alternatives with missing teeth. If they have good bone support around their teeth, they can have either implants, which is an artificial root structure placed down in the bone, allowed to heal, and we put a fixture on it that we can put a crown on it so it looks like a natural tooth. And that's one for one. There's also bridges where the tooth on each side of the space is reduced like to receive a crown, and between those two crowns, there's a replacement tooth, and that's cemented in. The other alternative is a removable partial denture. So it's like part of a denture with the little clasps, arms on it, and wires, and you can replace teeth, you know, two or three different ways, just depending on the case. So we always go over all the choices with the patients, the, the pros and the cons, and the benefits, and the risks, and the cost, and all that, and the comfort level, because an implant's going to be nicer than a bridge, and a bridge is going to be nicer than a partial denture. But some patients don't want to have a lot of things done in their mouth, and they'd rather have something like a partial denture that's done mostly at the laboratory, and we just deliver it, and they'll deal with a little bit of food that gets stuck underneath it. Occasionally, patients come in with problems like staining of the teeth or bad breath or things like that. Cigarettes are a problem, tea, especially tea, coffee to a degree, even the sodas can be a problem, like Coke, some of those that are darker colored sodas. And you can help part of that by using a, a whitening toothpaste formula. Obviously, with smoking, you want to stop that. And as far as the superficial staining from uh, wine, um, tea, coffee, and that, uh, I believe the whitening toothpaste do a pretty good job of getting rid of superficial stains. So you want to get on that right away so the stain doesn't get a chance to migrate very far into the tooth structure with the whitening toothpaste, or even a set of Crest White Strips would help lighten that up. As far as, as damage to teeth, you've got the staining. You also have generally just the teeth being in the mouth for a long time. You get that set of teeth when you're a teenager and you get to be 60 years old. The teeth have some natural wear on them, and the rest of it is usually from nighttime clenching and grindings at bruxism, which will cause the teeth to have micro fractures in them that over time the fractures can grow and grow until you end up with an abscess tooth even from a fracture that goes deep into the teeth. I don't seem to see too much of what somebody who doesn't clench or grind their teeth, they really don't touch their teeth together very much when they chew food. It isn't like it's a grist mill where they actually use the teeth to grind up food. The teeth come close and the food get, gets chewed in that closeness. It's the clenchers and grinders that end up with a really short, nubby teeth, and they would have to actually have their teeth rebuilt and have some kind of protective appliance made to keep their teeth from being worn down again. But I do see a lot of that damage from clenching and grinding of the teeth. Now, oftentimes, people will ask me, how much should I brush? I mean, how often do I need to brush? When do I need to brush? It gets down to the most important time of the day to brush your teeth is just before you go to bed. Brush and floss and get things cleaned out. Perhaps use a tongue scraper as well to clean off your tongue because at night those microorganisms have the chance to work uninterrupted by you talking or drinking something or eating something or bothering them with a toothbrush. They get that straight span of six, seven, eight hours is when they can do the most damage. 
Also, it's wonderful in the morning before you go to work or school or whatever if you brush and floss because your colleagues will appreciate it. The middle of the day is not so critical. As far as how long to brush, I would recommend an electric toothbrush with a timer built into it. A lot of the toothbrushes have a two-minute timer that will tell you every 30 seconds that now, okay, you can, you've done the outside uppers and now you can do the inside of the uppers and then the lowers outside and the lowers inside. You don't have to think about it. You don't have to get out a timer. You don't have to be working manually with that brush going, eh, this is exciting. Here we go, here we go. And it, it does a better job than a man. You, you can do as good a job with a manual brush as you can an electric, but the electric brush does the work for you so you don't have to sit there and go, little circles, little circles, little circles, aim toward the gum. It's crazy. So as far as time of day, the most important time is just before you go to bed at night. Then again in the morning, you don't have to do it at lunch when you're at work or at school or anything. I mean, with the kids, I do a whole routine about, you know, I'd like to have them brush after they come home and have their after school snack. The other thing you need to do is floss. You need to get in there with that floss and really run that around in there between the teeth. And if it bleeds, it's the only place in the body where if it bleeds, you go after it. You don't leave that alone. You want to keep flossing in there till it stops bleeding. That tells you the gums are healthy. And then by brushing on the teeth and flossing, you're going to get the gums healthy as well as the teeth. So you don't have to worry about, you can brush the gums and you can brush your tongue and the roof of your mouth, but really getting in there with the toothbrush and the floss, because that's the interface where the problem starts, is where the tooth and the gum meet. So you don't have to be all over the place brushing your tonsils or anything. That's unnecessary. But the flossing and the brushing, and the flossing is, you know, it seems to be a hassle. A lot of people claim they can't floss. So you want a couple feet of floss. And what you want to do is you want to wrap it on the middle fingers. And I just doubled this up so you can see it better. But a couple feet of floss on your middle fingers and about that much distance between it. That way it leaves your thumbs and forefingers free to manipulate the floss all over in your mouth and you can do a much better job instead of trying to put it on your index fingers and getting all frustrated and saying, I just can't do this, forget it. Because that's usually what happens when people try to use their index fingers instead of the middle fingers. As far as nutritionally, you know, apple juice is a problem. Apples aren't. Grape juice is a problem. Grapes aren't. It's having that bulk of that fiber in there will help carry that juice away. Is it, I mean, eating properly is important for all over the body. And also these microorganisms that like to live under your gums are the same ones they find plugging up your blood vessels. So that's why you want to get in there and floss and get that stuff out from under your gums. You don't want a whole pile of it there. So, you know, whole foods, not, I don't mean whole foods, the market, but, you know, whole grains and fruits and all this kind of stuff isn't going to make a problem as far as tooth decay goes. Refined sugar will. Now, as far as the general populace, they probably should be seen every six months, although there are patients we have that we see just once a year because they have excellent oral health and dental hygiene, and we don't need to see them every six months. But it, they, six months came about just because of a toothpaste commercial at one time, but it happens to be a good interval for most patients to be seen every six months. Sometimes patients need to be seen every three months, and sometimes it's once a year. And as far as indicators that you need to be seen, if you start to have sensitivity to sweets, to cold, if you notice that you know, your gums swell up, or even worse yet, your teeth are starting to move, especially for our older adult patients. You know, if the centrals used to be right here and the ones kind of kicking out now are sticking down, that's a definite indication you have problems. In closing, I would like to encourage all patients to get in to see a dentist on a regular basis because it's going to save you grief down the road. If you're not in at all, you may end up with a painful situation and you probably will if you're not seen and taken care of. And whatever dentist you want to see, you're certainly welcome to come to today's family dentist. That dental, that's wonderful. And see us. But do get in and make sure you get your infants in so they can have a good lifetime of dental health instead of a lifetime of problems because nobody wants to have to see the kids with tooth decay and problems.